Hello, this is Owen Jones. Welcome to the channel. Do press like and subscribe. I'm joined by the absolutely spectacularly amazing Gary Stevenson. Hello. Hello. Gary, right. Your backstory before we solve the current crisis. That's what we're going to do, by the way, in this video. We're going to solve everything. <laughs> but your background's astonishing. You're someone from a working class background who became a multimillionaire as a trader. How? Go and explain. Uh, so I got a job as a trader in 2008. Uh, I won a job in a card game back then. And my job was, cutting a long story short, to bet on basically when would we recover from the 2008 crisis. Um, and I came to the conclusion that essentially that we, we would never recover because there was a fundamental long-term problem of wealth inequality. Things would keep getting worse. So I started to bet that the economy would get worse and worse. And uh, by the end of the year that I did that, 2011, I became Citibank's most profitable trader in the world on the basis of some pretty uh, negative predictions. So I think we can safely say Gary knows what he's talking about. Uh, quite literally, the economic system put its money, where well, he put his money where his mouth is. I don't think that really works, but we'll work, <laughs> we'll work on an appropriate analogy, maybe at some point during this discussion. So look, Gary, let's be honest. Um, the, country, the, the country is pretty F-U-C-K-E-D. Um, the economy is trashed. But a lot of people might look at this and think, well, look, the Tories tried to tax, to cut taxes on the rich. <laughs> but instead of the left getting out their champagne and, and popping them, if they can afford them in the current cost of living crisis, people might go, well, yeah, fine. But if a left-wing government in the current context tried to do, for example, increasing public spending on the things we care about, same thing's going to happen. Game over. This time round, austerity is the only game in town. I think this is the big risk, basically, that we're going to face in the next few months and, and possibly years. If this gets debate gets framed entirely in terms of do we have austerity or do we not have austerity, then we're going to continually face this fact that if you run massive long term deficits to fund your day to day expenditures, bond markets will not allow it. And I think the risk that we have and the reason we allowed ourselves to be in this situation is because at the moment there's basically very little discussion of should we tax rich people more. And this is in the context of, in the last three years, the biggest and fastest ever increase in wealth by millionaires and billionaires in this country, the biggest and fastest ever increase in inequality. So in the last three years, the government's given out 600 million pounds. That would be 12,000 pounds for every adult in the country, but it's gone almost exclusively to richer people. They are still sitting on that money. If we were to tax rich people, we could take that money back, we could redistribute it, and we could give a massive cash injection to ordinary people, and this problem would be over. But at the moment, the debate is being framed simply around spending. Nobody's talking about funding. It's austerity or more spending. If we do not deal with taxing the richest, then it will not be possible to have a decent economy and a decent country. Well, one of the things I sort of put to you, which I found interesting about what's happened in the last few weeks, is traditionally an argument maybe against increasing taxes on the rich is it might spook the market. But it strikes me that actually the opposite happened here because a commitment to reverse planned increases to corporation tax partly spooked the markets. And this seems to be completely missing from this discussion. Like the, the government have been forced to increase corporation tax because otherwise the markets, well, the markets have disciplined them. I mean, is, does that make sense? Yeah, I, th I think there's been some kind of interesting like anthropomorphizing of the markets here, right? Um, the markets are not good guys and the markets are not bad guys, right? When it comes to government bond markets, the markets are the guys who are lending you money and they want their money back. OK, they, they, these are not people with moral intentions. They simply want their money back. It's as simple as that. Right. So they are going to judge your government's budgets, basically. And they're going to say, are you serious about paying us back? Um, so in the context of you cutting tax on the rich massively, just after an enormous increase in government debt, they're going to look at you and say, well, these guys are not going to pay our money back. And. I think they understand that more likely what will happen is inflation. So they will look for better investments. You know, you don't want to be lending money when the money's going to be inflated away. The value of the money will be inflated away. Um, but these guys, they're not moral arbiters. They will accept austerity. We've seen that in the post 2008 world. So all these guys want is their money back. Um, they don't care about living conditions. I, th I think we need to ask ourselves some questions about why it was that it was essentially the markets that prevented these tax cuts for the rich. But we, we can't expect the markets to discipline the government on everything they do. They will allow austerity. And, and if we don't prevent it, it will happen. In terms of taxing the rich, what, what are we talking about here? Let's start with income tax. Where would you put income tax? 
for a start. It's, because, you know, this, oh, here you go. Yeah, this is not about income taxes. This is not about income taxes. You know, if you make your money on income, you've already lost this game. You know, I've got friends from where I grew up earning three times average income, living on their mum's sofas who will never own property. You know, we, what really matters in this world nowadays is wealth and how much wealth you have. You know, and there's been a massive increase in wealth of the rich and the super rich. We have a tax system which is very good at taxing people who work. You know, I worked in the city. I made a lot of money and I paid 50% when I worked in the city. But the Duke of Westminster inherited £9 billion and paid nothing. You know, I think there's a technical problem here, which is during COVID, and if people don't understand how this worked, there's a video on my YouTube channel explaining it. The government gave out £600 billion that ended up with the rich. Now, it's worth stopping and asking yourself, what are the consequences of giving £600 billion to the rich? Now, in my opinion, if you're, do, if you're going to do that, the most likely consequence will be big increase in house prices, big increase in inequality, big increase in inflation, which is exactly what has happened. So we have this ability to give a ton of money to the rich in a crisis. And yet after the crisis, nobody talks about, well, how can we get that money back? If this is the situation you have, the way you manage an economy, it becomes inevitable that over time, inequality will get bigger and bigger. And the consequences of that are ordinary people losing their homes and living standards getting worse for ordinary people. We need to get tax rises for the rich. It's not about income taxes. It's about wealth taxes. It's about estate taxes. It's about how can we stop the richest people in the country from taking all of our wealth? No, you've made the argument repeatedly that actually the concentration of wealth isn't just like an immoral thing, but it's actually bad for the economy, that there's actually an economic argument against that. And you would link it actually to the conditions of people, for example, that you got with yourself. What do you mean by that? Why is this, you know, because actually now there's an argument for taxing the rich to avoid yeah. austerity, but you've argued that it's actually destabilizing the economy. How? All right. To answer that question, I want you to imagine you're Rishi Sunak. Imagine you're Rishi Sunak. <laughs> all right. So he's worth 700 million pounds. We, we approximate. That's times richness. So that means every year he will get as return on his wealth that he owns about 20 or 25 million pounds. OK, if you are receiving 20 or 25 million pounds because you own land and you own people's houses, and you own people's mortgages, how much are you going to spend? You're not going to spend 25 million pounds, right? You're going to spend 1 million, 2 million pounds, live like the queen, and they're going to use the other 23 million pounds to buy the rest of the assets. So when you have very high wealth inequality, that means you have ordinary people paying rent, mortgage bills to this group of very rich people who use that income to buy the rest of the wealth. So it sucks wealth out of the economy. And what that does is it sucks away ordinary people's spending power. Now, I spent a lot of time trying to understand why don't people spend more money in the aftermath of the 2008 crisis. Go and ask people. Ask people why they don't spend more money. They'll tell you it's because they don't have enough money. And if you look at that generationally, my friend's parents had properties and my friends will never own properties. So if ordinary families are losing their wealth over time, of course, they can't spend more money. So essentially, when you have this very high level of wealth inequality, it sucks the rest of the wealth out of the economy. It sucks the spending power out of the economy. And you end up basically losing your middle class. You no longer have a broad property owning middle class. You know, the reason this country has had good living conditions in the last 50, 60, 70 years is because it has had a broad property owning middle class. And if you allow wealth inequality to get out of control, you will lose that and you will lose your high living conditions. But if you tax wealthy people, they'll just leave the country, surely. Well, it didn't work for Roman Abramovich, did it? You know, I think what one thing that we learned from the Ukraine war was suddenly the government decided we do want to tax rich people, just only rich people who are Russian. And then we realized, you know, these rich people, they're not magicians, right? I think we tend to imagine these guys like they've just got a massive bag full of money. These guys are rich because they own our assets. They own our houses. They own our mortgages. They own the skyscrapers. They own the shops, right? They own the land. When, Rupert, when Roman Abramovich wanted to leave, he couldn't put Chelsea Football Club in a bag. Ultimately, the assets are here. We can tax the assets. It's a question about, do you want your country to be owned by people who pay tax or, or who don't? Someone when people hear wealth tax, they go, well, what about people who are asset rich but income poor? So like some old lady who's been living in a house that's suddenly inflated in price. Um, but if you ask her to pay a wealth tax, she'd be like, well, I don't even need you. Any, I've just got my pension. What do you say to that? Yeah, listen, I've got nothing against old ladies. My nan was an old lady. Um, look, this is not about taxing people with one million pounds, OK? This is about taxing people with 100 million pounds. OK, listen, I'm very happy to cut people out with one million, two million pounds. We don't need to tax you. But the, the truth is, 
we have this extremely wealthy class generating an enormous amount of income from the people of this country and using that income to buy the rest of the assets. If we don't stop that, ordinary families will lose their homes. It's as simple as that. And you don't need to tax necessarily people on one or two million pounds of wealth. You know, we need to go after the people with 100 million pounds of wealth. And if we don't, I guarantee you, they will end up owning everything. Um, I mean, do you think looking at Labour at the moment, I mean, they're kind of, the Tories are trying to put them in a box, which is kind of odd because the Tories have trashed the economy. This is on the Tories. You can see that quite easily. There are global crises going on, but what the Tories have done, they pressed a big red button, which has detonated the British economy. But now they're going to go, ah, we're fiscally responsible. Labour aren't. Um, they're not going to back. And, and Labour have actually, they've had so far come out and opposed cuts. We'll see how that sticks. But but do you, do you think at the moment they're, they're in the right place when it comes to, say, taxing the wealthy? And if they don't, do you think the Tories can end up bazookering them, even though it's ridiculous because the Tories cause this mess? Yeah, this is a very, very good question. It's very important. Okay, it's looking very, very likely that Labour will win the next election. That will probably happen. Um, if you believe me, and you don't have to believe me, but I've been betting on it for a long time successfully, that growing wealth inequality is basically destroying our economy. Labour do not have plans in place that will stop that growth in wealth inequality. They will slow it down, but they will not stop it. So in my opinion, what is likely to happen here is Labour will win the next election, They'll raise taxes very slightly on the richest, which will not be enough to increase to stop wealth inequality from increasing. Living conditions will continue to fall under a Labour government. People will get basically pissed off with, with a Labour government that is not improving their living standards. And it will, there's a very real chance that it gets followed by fascism. Listen, this is a real problem. Growing wealth, wealth inequality is growing very, very quickly now. If you do not stop that, your economy will die and you can't tinker around the edges. No, this is a cancer in the economy. And, you know, I speak to some people in Labour and some of them say they want to do it personally, but they don't think it's a vote winner, you know. So I think we need to speak to people directly and say, listen, if we don't deal with wealth inequality, you're going to lose your homes and, and your kids and your grandkids will fall into poverty. So I think we, if people understood how bad things will get if we don't fix wealth inequality, they would support it. So we need to educate people and then we need to force Labour to do it because if Labour don't do it, then they're not going to improve people's situation. Finally, you've got quite a unique vantage point because you've straddled two different parts of British society, which is working, being from a working class community, growing up with people who didn't really have very much, and then being associated with people who really do have a lot of money, a position you ended up in yourself. Um, from your perspective, if, because we've had 12 years of austerity, if there are more cuts in the next two years that's always in power, we don't know what obviously Labour will end up doing, I mean, what happens? What What is the consequences of that, do you think? There's no meat left to cut, right? There's no meat left to cut, right? You are talking about basically dismantling like the, the basic bare bones of a functioning state. And, um, you know, you, you talk about how I've seen both of these sides of the coin. And one thing that worries me, you know, I come from a poor background, but then I went to sort of elite universities, LSE, Oxford, and I worked in the city. And now I work in kind of journalism and activism. And most economists are from are rich essentially. And most journalists come from pretty comfortable backgrounds and they're not struggling. Um, the governor of the Bank of England earns half a million quid a year. You know, Liz Truss is rumoured to be worth eight million pounds. The problem we have here is everyone who has a voice is doing perfectly fine. You know, so there's not really anyone who's incentivized to fix this. So, you know, this is why I, I made my YouTube channel to speak directly to people and say, listen, the people who are supposed to be protecting you are not protecting you. You need to understand the only way to protect yourself is to reduce wealth inequality. And you need to demand it from your politician. You need to refuse to vote for anyone who will not offer you that. So, um, you know, I, I wish there were powerful interest groups out there that were going to reduce wealth inequality, but nobody's doing it. And it's a bunch of rich people, largely. So I'm calling out to people from ordinary backgrounds, people who are not rich, to say, listen, you need to demand this yourselves. You need to demand reducing wealth inequalities. It's the only way to protect yourselves and your kids. Which segues me to, very nicely, to my final point, which is whatever you're doing now, go and subscribe to Gary's YouTube channel. It's Gary Economics. I've got that right. I'm Gary's right. Economics. Gary's Economics. Gary's Economics. Go to his YouTube channel now. Press subscribe. But don't just press subscribe. Press the bell button so you'll get notifications from his YouTube channel. Do that with me as well. Obviously, if you're not subscribed, press the bell. And like this video. Obviously, go and share it. A lot of wisdom there for literally nothing. We've solved the economic crisis. Hopefully Labour now will 
listen to what Gary said, because quite literally he made his millions getting these calls right. So I think if Labour wants some economic expertise, I think Gary's the right person to go to. Thanks, Gary. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Ari.